Hi everyone, welcome to our Sunday online service. My name is Ida and it is great to be back with you guys. I hope you enjoyed the sunshine and the break last week. We're excited to be back and we have a great service lined up for you this morning. Later on, we're gonna hear from Dan Brown straight out of the United Arab Emirates. But first, let's come together and worship our God. So why don't you join me in prayer and let's stand together. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you just for the privilege to come and to worship you. I thank you that you are deserving of our praise and our worship. We give you the glory today, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. We worship you. Amen. Can I survive when we 
first blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging.
wake up And still I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been about you but I just feel over the moon that we've got a, a loving father who wants to hear from us and wants a relationship with us so let's join hands and let's pray to him right now dear father we thank you for bringing us through this week we thank you for every blessing and every provision for putting food on our tables and a roof over our head and for helping those who are vulnerable in this society here in High Wycombe there is always so much to do here but we thank you that You've given this church a mission to help people through initiatives like King's Table and Azalea, and we want those initiatives to grow with the support of the church and the community. We hope that there's even more compassion and love and support for each other in High Wycombe, and we just bring our hands together and we, we lay our worries and fears 
about finances, about our family, about the children, about our, our health and about COVID-19. We lay all those at your door, Father, because we know that you are the one and the only one who can help us with these gigantic challenges. And we also ask and pray that you would guide our country, our leaders in this country, to have their own compassion and to be led by your compass, your values, your commandments, as they think about COVID, as they think about refugees, as they think about the economy. Let them have an outpouring of mercy and compassion and fairness and justice for every single corner of our society across the nation. So we bring all these things to you, Father, for your guidance, your support, and your illumination, and we thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a great prayer. Thank you so much, Roy. Well, if this is your first time joining us this morning, we would love to hear from you. Drop a message in the live chat to let us know you're watching. And if you want to find out more about the church or for ways to connect, head to our website and click on the I'm New button. Now this summer, we are encouraging the whole church to prayer walk the streets of High Wycombe. Zoe and Ella have been doing just that and they're going to share with us what they've been up to. Hi, we're at the beach. But a few days ago, we were still in High Wycombe and we did prayer walking around the local streets near where we lived. We did it the King's Kids way at first, singing Ben and Claire's song. Would you like to sing it, Ella? Yeah. People of High Wickham, we've got something to say. People of High Wickham, we've got something to pray. For the love of the one who made us all. Two, three, four, floods our street and fills them all. People of High Wickham, this is what we pray. And then we walked down the roads and I quietly prayed in tongues, prayed blessing over the neighbours and prayed anything specific that came to mind from the Holy Spirit. How did you find it, Ella? Amazing. Yep. Yeah. And I found it easy and a blessing. Bye. Bye. I love it. What an encouragement to just get out there and walk our streets while praying a blessing over our town. Thank you so much to everyone who has already participated. We want to see every street in High Wycombe covered in prayer before the end of the summer. Taking part is so simple. Head to our prayer page, kchw.co.uk forward slash prayer to find out how. And praying for one another is also super important. If you're watching live today, there will be an opportunity to pray with someone if that's what you need right now. Look out for the link in the live chat later on. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker Dan this morning. I've personally known Dan and his wife Monica for many years and they have been active members of King's Church for a long time. They now live and minister in the United Arab Emirates where they provide teaching, training and mentoring to Christian workers while also sharing Christ. Dan is speaking from 2 Kings chapter 2 this morning. Let's read the passage together. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. 
Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Now before Dan speaks, let's take a look at this short clip. Look! Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you all again, even if it's at a distance through the miracle of these holy electrons. But uh, we give you greetings from the United Arab Emirates where we live. And we miss you all. We really wish that before too long, we could be back with you again. Well, what did you think of that uh, clip from the movie Matilda? Kind of weird, right? Uh, do some of you like weird movies, spooky things, stuff with magical powers? How many of you like sci-fi movies? Raise your hand. Go ahead, raise them up. Even on YouTube, you can raise your hand. Um, I know many people have seen every Matrix movie that's ever been made. Uh, Monica and I have Netflix, and many of you do too. We enjoyed the uh, series Stranger Things, you know, with all the monsters and the, the world below and all that. Um, Many of you have seen every Star Wars movie, some love certain Marvel superheroes movie. All of these things, of course, all these shows and movies have one thing in common. They're fiction, okay? That's the fi in sci-fi, science fiction. Now, when we come to the Bible, of course, there is also lots of supernatural in the Bible. And we might be tempted to think, oh, I wonder if some of these strange stories are kind of like the movies. In other words, not totally real, uh, maybe a little bit made up or fanciful. Uh, do you ever feel that way? I mean, what about some, you know, could Jonah really have spent three days in the belly of a whale or, or large fish? Could Jesus really have been born of a virgin? Um, but these things aren't fiction. You know, when we talk about scriptural stories, they're not made up. They're not simply tall tales. None of them are, are wacky. All right, they're all reasonable. In fact, what would be unreasonable is if you have an all-powerful creator God who created the, the heavens and the earth, and yet somehow through life, there can never be supernatural. There can never be miracles. That, of course, would not be a, a reasonable presupposition. Well, today, we're going to be looking at a few accounts of where the other side, the other realm, invades into normal human uh, existence or experience. Sort of some mind-bending uh, situations, if you will. And maybe you'll like those kind of things, but uh, some will, some won't. But let me assure you, these are not just interesting things. These are actually very practical for you and for me as we live the Christian life. And hopefully, as you'll see, these are not just sort of cerebral things, but these really do uh, impact the human heart, our hearts, as we follow Jesus. Well, did you like our story, 2 Kings 2, when Elijah is being taken up to heaven? It's really a moving account um, of how an older mentor is leaving 
And the younger person who has been mentored and discipled doesn't want to let go. He just loves him so much, he just can't even contemplate that he would lose Elisha. Elijah. It's a little bit confusing because we have Elijah, who's the older guy, and Elisha, the younger one who has been mentored and who will be Elijah's successor. Uh, but this is the day that God is finishing the long, amazing career of Elijah. He's been the prophet of Israel for decades, amazing career serving the Lord in that place during a, a terrible time spiritually for Israel. Um, awful kings like Ahab and his wife Jezebel and really kings that would lead Israel into apostasy and yet God raised up Elijah to stand against that and to confront it. Um, and he's had this amazing ministry for decades. But this is the day that it says that God would take him up to heaven in, in a whirlwind. Um, and again, like I said, it's rather touching. Elisha goes along, okay? And three times Elijah wants to say, okay, Elijah, you stay here. I'm going to go over here. And then he, he, he'll just leave, kind of sneak away, you know, make, make it a little bit easier. And three times uh, Elisha says, no way, Jose. You know, that's as you live and as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. I'm going wherever you go. I'm going to be with you to the last minute. It's also kind of humorous, too, that twice, um, first at Bethel and then at Jericho, some group of prophets come out and they just happen to know miraculously, you know, a word from the Lord saying, hey, Elijah, today's the day. Uh, get ready to say goodbye to your master. And uh, each time Elisha's response is, oh, don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Be quiet. You know, uh, I'm sticking with him. Maybe, maybe God will change his mind. Um, but eventually Elijah is in fact taken up and transferred to heaven. Uh, but, you know, heaven is not just at a certain altitude. You know, these, these chariots of fire uh, didn't just take him up to a certain altitude above the stratosphere, and that's where heaven is. No, it, he actually went up to a different dimension. And these, these chariots of horses of fire, you know, they had a different color, a different texture. There was a luminescence, as is often the case when other dimensions, when the heavenly dimensions come in. And so he goes up and up and up, and then in a moment, boom, that's it transferred out of our normal dimensions. Um, well, there, you know, there's another, a number of other sort of, I would call dimension bending accounts or miracles of the supernatural in scripture, of people appearing and then disappearing, or human beings like you and me uh, being able to see things beyond the normal earthly realm that we normally wouldn't be able to see, where temporarily the veil over our, our perception or our eyes is taken away. Now, you and I live in three dimensions, right? Three-dimensional world, three-dimensional existence. We have up and down, left and right, back and forth. We live in three dimensions. Uh, and yet it would seem from a lot of these biblical accounts that other dimensions come into play, a fourth dimension, a fifth dimension, whatever. Um, well, how can that be? What, what would that be like? How can we get our minds around that? Um, let me give you a little illustration that might help. It helps me. Imagine you're an ant, okay? And your whole world is a particular tabletop and you can't go beyond the edges. You can go anywhere you want on the tabletop, but as you think about it, essentially your whole existence is in two dimensions, back and forth, left and right, that's it. No up and down for you, Mr. Ant. Um, and then one day, a human being comes along your table, your table and puts his finger down right in front of your nose from above. And you, the ant, say, what's that? And then he lifts it, and it, then the finger disappears. It's a miracle. I've never, you know, it's, it's impossible to understand because a third dimension has entered into your two dimensions. Um, and, of course, we live in three dimensions, so we can go up and down. So in the same way, our, we're limited to these three dimensions, but God isn't and heavenly beings are not. Uh, so they're probably coming in from other dimensions. Well, as you think about it, there are many accounts like this in scripture. When Jesus was born, the shepherds are shepherding their flocks by night on the hills around Bethlehem, and angels appear, and they're singing. I mean, that's not a normal phenomenon, right? Um, but uh, the scripture is very clear, you know, Psalm 29, about heavenly beings. They exist. We just don't normally see them. Uh, maybe that's 
proof of the existence of aliens. I don't know, but there are, there are angels or heavenly beings in our universe. Remember Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Um, you know, Peter, James, and God, John go with him up to what is probably Mount Hermon in Lebanon. And uh, they, uh, they just have this fantastic experience. And Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. They're all kind of shining, you know, again, that luminescence. And uh, that was a, an amazing supernatural event. After the resurrection, the crucifixion resurrection, two of Jesus' disciples were walking on the road from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, about five miles away. And Jesus walks up to them in his resurrected state, and he joins them, and they are prevented somehow, a miracle, from recognizing who this person is. They just think he's a, a normal guy. And so they go along and spend the afternoon together. Um, and uh, then Jesus, when it's dinner time, takes the bread, breaks it, gives thanks, and at that moment, they recognize this is Jesus, and then he disappears. He disappears. Uh, other stories like that, you know, again, after the resurrection, uh, the disciples are in a locked room, fully locked, no windows, no doors that are open, and then Jesus just appears uh, with them and says, peace be upon you. Again, coming in from the other dimension. Uh, Stephen, just before he dies, loses consciousness while being stoned, says, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. So he, he gets to see something that humans are not normally allowed to see. We have Philip the evangelist, goes along sharing the gospel from Isaiah 53 to the Ethiopian eunuch. And then after he baptizes him, he disappears. And he's transported uh, dozens of miles away. Um, Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Paul was allowed by God to see things that you and I aren't going to be able to see in this life. And then, of, this, of these kinds of stories, there's my all-time favorite. Now, Elisha, years later, he's now the main guy, uh, he has made a real bad enemy of the Syrian king, the Syrian ruler. And there's now hundreds, if not more, Syrian soldiers out to get him, to arrest him and take him back up to... Um, to Damascus or somewhere up, up there. And one morning, Sir, uh, Elisha's servant goes, opens the door, went out to get the newspaper or something, and he's like, there's hundreds of these Syrian soldiers. He slams the door, rushes inside, Elijah, do something, we're in big, big trouble here, they're, they're gonna get us, they're gonna kill us, what are we gonna do? And Elijah just says, hey, buddy, chill, uh, don't worry. Uh, God, would, will you let my servant see what I already see? So he says, go outside again, take another look. So the servant goes outside, opens the door, and opens it, and he gets to see there's myriads of angels surrounding him who aren't going to let anything bad that day happen to Elisha or the servant. I mean, can you imagine seeing that kind of thing? Can you imagine the experience being there that day? So a lot of these kinds of miraculous accounts in Scripture, supernatural, and they really happened. Well, I would like to suggest for us four, four applications uh, for us this morning and applying these things. First of all, materialism is a lie. Now, what do I mean by materialism? Do I mean money and consumerism? No, no, no. Materialism in the sense of the atheistic, secular uh, belief that there is nothing but the material universe, that the physical realm is all there is, what we can sense with our five senses or through science, and uh, there's no spirit, there's no God, there's no supernatural, there's no mir miracles. In fact, everything in our universe and everything on our planet is just an accident, really. Um, the random particles and forces and everything in my life is just sort of electrochemical events in my head, uh, and all human behavior is simply atoms and forces and inevitable actions. And of course, there's no responsibility uh, if that's your worldview. And all the beauty, all the love, all the warmth that you might experience in life, well, great, but it's just an illusion um, in materialism. You know, our, our son and his daughter, uh, I mean, and his wife just had their first baby last week. 
and they're just having a fantastic week of enjoying little Sammy and the love between them and the bonds. And, and yet materialism would say, okay, great, enjoy it, but there really is no meaning in that. Uh, there's nothing eternal in that. And of course, in that context, ultimately there's no ethics, there's no right or wrong, or whatever there is is extraordinarily uh, relevant uh, or relate, um, you know, vary between what you might believe or what I might believe. And you know, all of us have experienced where we've seen, heard a speaker or seen a TV show where Christians are mocked. Oh, you, you people who believe the Bible, I mean, what did you check your brain at the door? I mean, what about all these stories, these, these myths and the creation, seven day creation, and how can you believe those things? Because science has proven there is no God or he's not relevant and you know, the world around us has happened you know, through evolution, not through some creationism. And uh, you ever feel intimidated by that? Or do you know anybody, a Christian, who has lost their faith by being hoodwinked by, by atheists? I think of, of one um, atheist debater who, uh, his name is Richard Dawkins. Maybe you've heard of him in his book, uh, The God Delusion. And... Uh, he says basically, you know, he just kind of shouts in derision, oh, how can you believe these things? And, you know, there is no creation. Evolution has proved its fault. It's not right. And, you know, as if just pouring derision is, is mixed up for a lack of, of good arguments. But, you know, neo-Darwinism actually is not proven by any stretch of the imagination. There are big holes in actually the theory of evolution. And the honest ones will admit that uh, even to this day. And others will point out that even if, even if you're not a Christian or a, one who believes the Bible, going down this materialistic path is really destructive for the human soul and really destructive for society. And these days, uh, for example, Douglas Murray, who is not yet in the kingdom, is saying this. We, we can't go down that path. We, we can't lose our heritage. And there can't be this spiritual vacuum. Um, you know, don't buy into materialism. Um, so anyway, uh, application number one being materialism is a lie. And contrary to that, application number two is scripture is reliable. The word of God, the Bible, is believable. And uh, you know, it's not true that scripture is somehow backward or that there's, these great, there's this great tension between science and faith or scientific theories and uh, scripture. Um, I love listening to anything I can get my hands on by John Lennox on YouTube, lots of videos on YouTube. He's a professor emeritus of mathematics at Oxford and knows lots of science, of course, besides just being brilliant in mathematics. And he says there is no such tension, properly understood. Now, there is a tension between faith and scientism, which is this almost religious clutching on to science as if it can answer every question and satisfy the needs of the human soul and then describe what meaning is all about. And of course, that's ridiculous. It can't. Science is not equipped to answer those kinds of questions. Um, and we know, in fact, that even where scripture does speak about physics or natural processes, that it speaks accurately. It speaks believably. Um, and sometimes it takes a long time for science, in fact, to catch up. Let me give you three examples. We know from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Scripture is very clear. Everything we see, our universe, the cosmos, had a beginning. Well, you know, for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, a secularism believed the opposite. Nope, there's no beginning. The universe has just always been here, going back all the way to Aristotle, he championed this view. Even to recent days, scientists would say, no, 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 we, we don't believe in a beginning, until about the 1960s. In the 1960s, uh, there began to evolve this consensus around the Big Bang Theory. And we don't know, even to this day, is that exactly what happened, but now science is saying, no, actually we realize there absolutely was a beginning. Um, and, and I've even read that some atheists say, actually, that's a problem for us uh, in supporting atheism. But it's clear that, that uh, the universe did, in fact, have a beginning. Another example. Hebrews 
11.3 says this, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, uh, but out of things that are not visible, okay? And again, what he's saying is that our normal world, you know, our bodies, our chairs, our houses, our food, whatever, um, ultimately or, or initially came about by unseen forces and matter or in the hands of God. Well, again, at the time, the, the, uh, the science of the day would have said, no, that's ridiculous. We know that everything is a matter of earth, wind, fire, and water, and ether. So don't talk about unseen things. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. And today, no one would doubt the, the greater reality of unseen particles and forces and everything else. Finally, another example is that, you know, these accounts that we've looked at in Scripture again, have people passing from the visible to the invisible or back and forth, and that there's a realm of God's existence and a realm of angelic existence that is not inside our three visible dimensions. And uh, again, for hundreds and hundreds of years, secular scientists would say, that is absurd, that's a fairy tale, how can you believe such things? There is no such other you know, existences and spheres of reality until about 30 years ago. Now, the leading theory in science to understand our physical universe, to put your arms around cosmology and say, this is, this is our leading best idea of how things are the way they are physically, is called string theory. Uh, string theory. And I won't try to get into it. I don't, I don't pretend to understand it myself. But it does say that there must be at least 11 dimensions in our cosmos, in our physical universe. 11, not just three, there must be a lot more than three. Now they're not saying therefore there's angels in dimension number seven or whatever, but they're saying that the idea of other existences all around us is not unreasonable at all, is not irrational, is not unscientific in any way. So again, uh, application number two, scripture is reliable. Thirdly, I would just remind all of us, or we actually can remind ourselves daily, that this life is temporary. It's temporary. Uh, and we have our normal existence, our cars, our houses, our loved ones, our food, our health or lack of health, our shopping at Tesco, our bank accounts, you know, we know what that's like. But scripture says, okay, that's real, but it's not the ultimate reality. It has significance, but it is not the ultimate significance for you or for me. And whatever problems you may be grappling with are also temporary. I love how Paul says it, 2 Corinthians 4, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not at the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Again, so number three, just to remind ourselves that this life is, is temporary and whatever problems we have in it are temporary. And lastly, uh, I know that many can struggle with doubts. Do you struggle with doubts? I, I think if we're all honest at different times, we have you know, different question marks and struggles and Lord, it'll help, help my unbelief. Um, I love this book that Norman Geisler recently put out. Uh, he's an amazing apologist for the Christian faith. And this, is, this book isn't very long, and it's probably his best book in apologetics. And it's titled, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And Norman Geisler, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And he goes through and he basically you know, demonstrates uh, uh, powerfully um, the wonder of, of the universe and that how that points to a creator, and the wonder of creation of earth itself, which of course points to God, and the reliability of scripture, and all the evidence historically, and all that we understand of who Jesus is and was, uh, and how the, all of the evidentiary support for that. The point is, your faith is on solid ground. Brothers and sisters, your faith is on solid ground.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these truths. Thank you for these assurances from the Word of God and beyond the Word of God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit inside us that confirms these things to us. We pray that these things this morning go beyond simply our minds, also to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, would you build up our faith in Jesus' name. Um, Monica's here. Hey, greetings everyone at King's Church. Hi, Wickham. Salama alaikum, as we say here in the Arab desert, and I'm enjoying this um, 11th dimension of Zoom because we've been able to have you in our home and we can be in your home, and it's been nice to connect with you a few times um, that way, and hopefully we'll get to see all of you sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan, for speaking to us this morning, and so lovely to see Monica too. What a great reminder to not overlook the supernatural. Let's take a moment to spend some time in God's presence and worship together. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is in Evidence is all around But the Spirit of the Lord is here The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here Evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we. Your kingdom come, your will be 
God, I thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. I thank you that we can come before you and we can speak to you, we can experience you and we can encounter you. I pray now for all of us that you would fill us with your spirit. Would you fill us with your faith, your courage and your peace. Thank you, God, for the beauty of being in your presence. Amen. It might be that what Dan talked about um, this morning raised some big questions for you about the Christian faith, especially if you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus. If that's you, a great place to ask those big questions in a very open and informal environment is the Alpha Course. Our next Alpha Course starts in September and I really encourage you to sign up if you want to find out more about the Christian faith. Go to kchw.co.uk forward slash alpha for more information. It might also be that you're struggling with doubt at the moment as dad mentioned. If that's you, I encourage you to share those doubts with someone and pray with them. You can do that right now with our prayer team who are available online. Click the link in the live chat or go to our prayer page on our website and click request prayer. You'll be greeted by our prayer host who will then put you through to a member of our prayer team who will pray with you. Before we finish the meeting, if you would like to give to the work of Kings, you can do so by going to our giving page or via text message. Just text KCHW gift followed by the amount you wish to give to 70085. All the details are on the screen and will be on the screen at the end of the meeting. Thank you so much for your ongoing generosity. 
Well, that's it from me. Thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great week and I'll see you soon.